I would like now to introduce uh, the real keynote that is from uh, Dr. Henry Westco, that is uh, the scientific director of LNLX, that is the uh, Centro Group uh, in Brazil. And uh, I am partially Brazilian because I grew up in my high school time in Brazil. And it is really for me every time that I go there, remind me that Brazil is a great country, has a long tradition in uh, nuclear science. Uh, I don't know if many of you know that Brazil is one of the few countries that is a completely autonomous uh, technology to enrich uranium for peaceful applications. And this is done in Sao Paulo, in Brazil. As in Sao Paulo, there is also the LNLS, that is the largest synchro uh, south of the equator, and they have a project to build also a second one, larger and more powerful, with, uh, and we will hear something from Dr. Uh, Westman, that he has uh, a PhD from the University of Campinas, experience working here in the States uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the Department of Energy. So, Harry, thank you for coming from Brazil. It's really nice to see you here. Well, thank you, Ron, uh, for, for coming, for joining us. And, uh, and thank you for the entire and my team for inviting us, for showing uh, an overview of what we have been doing for the last few years with uh, this partnership with uh, National Instruments. It's a great pleasure for me to, to be able here to show the results of this part of this work and the, the plans that we have for the future. And these plans include the, the large synchrotron that we're building now. And uh, well, I'm not going to talk too many details about the, the specifics of this synchrotron. I think that the community is not completely focused on synchrotron, but I'll touch some aspects of this project with respect to what we have in, uh, with, uh, in, in COTS and uh, in the graphical programming technologies. Um, so we are a private institution uh, that is has a contract with the Ministry of Science and Technology in Brazil. And, uh, Oops. Okay. Is there a pointer? Oh, here. Okay. So this is our center. Uh, we are. Uh, we have a contract. Then the CNPE is the private, is non-profit institution that manages four national laboratories for the Ministry of Science and Technology. And uh, here we have the synchrotron that we currently uh, manage. Then we have the nanotechnology laboratory. Biology Technology uh, Laboratory and the Bioethanol Laboratory. Bioethanol is a very uh, important uh, thing in Brazil. We have most of our cars running on bioethanol. And, um, and uh, this center is dedicated to studying other ways of generating bioethanol. And uh, this is a simulation with that it's not built yet of the new synchro. It's, it's called Sirius. Uh, uh, it's related to the brightest star in the sky. And, um, <coughs> Just to give you, give you an idea of, of this project, the vault. So this is the only synchro in Latin America, um, and uh, this project is going to be the, the, the most uh, the most brilliant source, red incineration source in the world when it's ready. So the idea is that it's going to be ready in a few in and up open to users in 2018. Just an overview of our history. We started back in 1981, and the first discussions in Rio de Janeiro. Actually, the synchro at that time. Singer was being decided where to be, uh, where it was going to be. Unfortunately, it was not chosen to be in Rio. Otherwise, it would be different in my life. But uh, anyway, we are in Campinas. It's a nice place as well. And uh, we have a couple of people being trained here in the US. We had a, all the beginning of our singer was partially, uh, we had Brazilians in Stanford being trained. And we have our first being minus job in Kennedy, which is now I think, not operation anymore. So we went on and on from, from, from this time. 1997 is when we started operations for users. So our synchrotron is already uh, operating for 17 years already. And, uh, and now it's time to move on to a new machine. And so this, um, in, back in 2006, the, the council that manages our private institution requested the first studies for a new third generation machine. And so now then we spent a couple of years uh, discussing with the community. We had the first project designed in 2008. And now, basically, after this, uh, there was a point where the machine committees decided that we should aim for the 
smallest emitters, which basically says the highest brilliant synchrotron in the world, for when it's ready, then it's going to be still a competitive machine. Now, we have all the earthworks uh, done uh, and the detailed engineering design concluded. We're just in the process of hiring the construction company, so we expect in the next month to start construction of the synchrotron. Um, it's the only synchrotron in Latin America. It was built the, during the historical uh, time that I showed you. It was built during that time when it was very hard for Brazil to import or to be open to market of electronics and so on. So we have to basically build everything from the ground up. And uh, so when you go to our synchrotron, basically everything you see except for off the shelf and, and detectors, some of them are basically were basically done there in our campus. Um, so this is an overview. This is the inside of the hall, the experimental hall of our current secret. Back of beam lines. In fact, it's, it, we cannot do beam lines anymore. It's a second generation machine, so it has a higher emitters. The emitters is number, well, for those who don't know, it's basically the product of the size of your beam by the divergence. So it's expressed in a length times an angle. And uh, we have 18 beam lines. It's a second generation machine, so we can only have a few of these most brilliant sources, which are called insertion devices. And today we have about uh, 1,200 users. So this new syndrome, which is going to be a 3GV, third generation, is the smallest emitters in the world of a machine being construction. So it's going to be uh, the highest brilliance uh, of all synchrotrons. And uh, in fact, if you look uh, closely, it will be uh, in a factor of seven to one to the journals, the best journal synchrotron, not to relate anything to the soccer. And we used to be known as the country of soccer, but nowadays we have to be known as the country of synchro, I guess. <laughs> so this is just an evolution of the <clears throat> The beam lines and users, most of our users of the synchrotron come from the state of Sao Paulo. We have an increasing number of people coming from the states and other countries. Of course, with CDUs, we expect to have a much larger number of people coming from other countries. Now, I'm going to show a couple of examples uh, of things that we have done in the last few years. So, uh, just to put everyone on the same pace, it's a very sketchy uh, model of a synchrotron. So, we have electrons at the speed of light, uh, pumped up by radio frequency cavities and monitored by the monitors, uh, the brain frequency monitors. And the, uh, at every time these electrons at the speed of light, uh, they are forced, they are bent, they are trajectory by strong magnetic fields of the order of one Tesla. They emit the radiation, which is collected by some kind of optics and put in an experimental station uh, so that we can study materials. So each one of those beam lines basically do this kind of thing in different ways. Uh, insertion devices are basically the, the tools. So this is an electron passing through a dipole and emitting radiation. This is what's collected. And insertion devices, they emit uh, radiation in a much more collimated way. So we expect to have third generation synchrotron based, based on, on mostly on insertion devices. And uh, that's a major gain that we'll have in the future. Um, some of you may know the development that we have done uh, with uh, NI Brazil. Uh, we have, when we started this collaboration, we had a, a, basically a project to start using uh, off-the-shelf uh, equipment, custom off-the-shelf, version off-the-shelf, and, and uh, graphical programming. But we wanted to use also lab, uh, Apex, and the main idea is that we, we wanted to move from something that was in-house development uh, in software and hardware to something which were more manageable. And uh, so, in a sense, we wanted to use LabVIEW real-time as a platform for controlling and data position and so on, but we also wanted to be able to talk to the, to the rest of the world with Apex for several reasons. We had most of our software for analysis and data acquisition and scripts written in, in, in Apex on, on the community, so we wanted to make use of that. So then together we developed this platform that used the shared memory uh, through a, a software way which we call Hypey, and uh, that is able to collect data from LabVIEW in real time and to propagate this into the Apex server so that we can have all the data available for the uh, on, on our network. And, uh, and this was a major uh, important development for us. Now, all of our vertical beam lines are running in this kind of scheme and it's very robust. And uh, we basically have a standard way of controlling beam lines. Uh, just to give you an idea of what we have, the kind of records that we can have in, in, in Apex, uh, error detectors and, and logics and motors and scalars and drivers. And uh, this is basically all the kind of the hardware that we use nowadays and the way they are supported in Apex, things that are implemented, things that we are implementing. The Compact Rio also has, uh, we use for several distributed uh, data acquisition that they, they connect to EtherCAT. And uh, I can say basically that we have a standard solution that is working uh, fine. 
but we have to move, move ahead. I'll show some of the examples of what we're planning for the near, near future. This, uh, basically, one of the major results of this project, besides standardizing the control on the beam lines and allowing us a more robust and, and, and cost uh, solution, um, the project that allowed us to do all this refurbishing was, was, was basically asked by Petrobras to give us remote operation control of the beam line to browsers. So nowadays we have our beam lines they can be operated by users from browsers. So most of the users that can do experiments, well, we separate experiments and, and, and basically measurements. If you can want to do a measurement just to have hundreds of samples, and, and that happens a lot, so you don't have to come to the lab. Just ship your samples and you use your browser to connect. This is a couple of examples of smog and scattering. This is diffraction, browser interface. This is a spectro X-ray spectroscopy. And even tomography, uh, we have to, we do all the processing and the, the user can do the data position through the web browser. So this is one part of the solution. Uh, I picked one example of one beam line that we have with several different features of, uh, of this hardware solution using COTS and program interface. Basically tomography, which is very, uh, well, most of us know what, what it is or had the experience of doing a tomography. In a synchrotron, we can do the same, but with much smaller samples and much higher resolution. But the principle is the same. You have x-rays, you have a sample rotating in front of the x-rays, and then you convert the x-rays uh, to a CCD, and you get 3D information on the object. Um, basically, this is the beam line that is controlled with the PXI to do this uh, acquisition. We have all the sample stage uh, this tower is to move the sample and rotate and so on within some micro resolution and uh, it has to be synchronized with the detector so that you do the position and, and rotation of your sample and opening shutters and so on it has to be all uh, orchestrated by a uh, centralized system and so we use this centralized system through uh, the PXI it basically handles different uh, drivers that we have to use from different manufacturers uh, CCD cameras and all this stuff Basically, PXI do all this, uh, this orchestrating so that we have the sample exposed only when it needs to be exposed. X-rays, they damage samples, they don't. You, you don't want to have them uh, exposing your samples to X-rays all the time. So you better do a very good synchronization so that you won't expose when you're actually measuring. And so this synchronization was essential for the experiments. And uh, we nowadays have the Dreamline operating through this system and remote to the um, web browser. Now going to the detector system of this kind of experiment, um, we have a project to, to build our own detectors. So we started collaborating in a CERN consortium. We are part of it. It's called Medipix. Uh, basically, uh, the simplest way of converting X-rays to digital information is convert them to visible light, to a scintillator, and then you use a standard CCD. But the best way is if you can convert directly X-rays into, elect into electrical signals and digitalize them. And this is what this kind of very nice ship does. You basically have a sensor that converts X-rays into electrical pulses, and every pixel has its own digital and an analog, and every circuitry is built in in a synchrotron within 50 microns of size. And um, <clears throat> so the consortium provides these this ships and all the connections and so on, and we started a project to move to integrate several of these ships. There are other projects I will mention briefly. And to make a large area detector. So the goal is to make actually a large panel built from tiny sensors, but we have the, the consortium deals with the ship. We have to provide our own readout system for this large uh, array of detectors. Um, and we are doing that in, in different options. One option is we are using the PXI to, to read this. Uh, the timeline source has a similar project, it's called Merlin, um, for reading one single ship. I think well, the most limitation nowadays is that we have to read these 12 ships using eight lines in parallel. That increases a lot, speeds up, but we need 661 LBDS pairs to do this kind of readout. And uh, so uh, if you use only one, you require 59. If you use eight, eight pairs of the readout in parallel, you require only 122. Uh, unfortunately, most of the systems that we can find nowadays uh, on VXI, they have only 66. Uh, LVDS pairs, and uh, so that limits basically the amount of time you require to read out and to push all the digital data for your for, for, for storage. Um, so that's the kind of rate that we have nowadays. By 
so we are using this, this board. We know that there are a lot of faster boards, but basically the limitation nowadays is the number of LVDS pairs. Uh, for next year, we've, we've been, we are, we're putting to work this 12-ship system. Uh, so far, we're working on an in-house solution to increase the number of LVDS power pairs. And for CDUs, the, the idea is to have this huge amount of data. This is big data. So it's a big flat panel uh, with a uh, full of, uh, of ships. And, um, and I think this is going to be a big challenge. So at the same time, we're developing the new synchrotron. We are also developing uh, detectors for reading out, which is as important as producing the radiation is collecting it. Um, so just an idea of what is the, the we kind of a wish list of what we should have for this project. Uh, it's a, a board with a large number of LVDS, lossless transformation, and onboard memory to store all these images in every board. Now moving to the uh, beam positioning systems that we have uh, in the accelerator. Uh, we worked out a few years ago a solution for uh, controlling a distributed control of, of the uh, beam positioning monitor. So basically you have to monitor every time the electron beam passes through uh, a, a sensor, you monitor its position with precision, and you have to keep it on orbit. So every one of these beam monitor positions has to uh, be integrated in a matrix that calculates the distortion of this orbit and applies some kind of feedback correction to the system so that it keeps the orbit stable. Um, this system uh, it was uh, very interesting because it served as, as a very learning uh, project for uh, having this millisecond synchronizations. And uh, nowadays uh, we are practically done in a 90 hertz bandwidth of corrections. We were working in the in-house solution of sub-hertz uh, correction. Uh, but the goal for Sirius is to go for kilohertz, so we, we have a also a big challenge here. Uh, just to give you an idea, this is kind of result that we have nowadays for the beam positioning monitors. So this is our, these are each one of the beam positioning monitors, and this is something we couldn't see in the past, like millisecond time acquisition. And just to give you an idea, this is the frequency spectrum of, of, of perturbations that we have in storage. We have all kinds of perturbations, from, from the power supplies to vibration of the floor. So we can have a reliable way of detecting these uh, this bands of, of, of noise easily, and even applying fast, uh, forward corrections to these uh, well-known noises. Uh, this will have an, an idea of when we have this insertion device basically changes magnetic fields on the electron orbit and so causes a large number of perturbations. If we don't have a reliable correction system, you're all the time shaking the electron beam, so one user does an experiment, the other has a beam completely shaken. So you have to have a system that corrects all the time. So these are curves of the magnetic field of this insertion device, changing the magnetic field for one user. And this green curve is, when, uh, is the beam positioning monitor, the same beam positioning monitor, showing that basically there are some quirks here, but when we switch off the beam, correction, beam positioning system, uh, basically screw up completely the beam. And so this was a major advance and in, in, in basically allowed us to move faster the experiments without any other user uh, feeling this, this the perturbation of the, of the system. Uh, so as I said, for Sirius, we are all working in an in-house uh, solution. And basically, uh, we are building well. I think that it's on the, on the blood of most of our engineers to start uh, you know, build, doing in-house solutions. So, um, Whenever they find out a problem like that, uh, basically you have on Sirius several beam positioning monitors. You have to convert radio frequency, so the electron passes through antennas, generates radio frequency. We have to convert the digital information, put in a feedback system in a matrix that recalculates and returns to the correction system of the orbit. Uh, this system is, uh, is most of these boards they were developed in house. For the moment, they're using micro TCA physics grade for, for, for increasing speed. And, uh, but again, it's another project that we are collaborating in different areas. One part of this uh, correction system, which is crucial for us, is that all of these boards that we use for radio frequency detection and digitalization, we have to build hundreds of them. And, uh, and so they are being built. And uh, we need a system that can reliably test and check for all the features that we need to work as a quality control of these boards. So we have now a PXI system uh, with a test bench for each one of these BPN from the end electronics. So we have a system that does all the tests integrated to the PXI, and we have a test report that is generated automatically so we know that we, the board that was built 
is within the quality uh, standards or not. Um, uh, just a, a quick example also on the radio frequency. Uh, the, the battery that, that feeds the LED electron energy so that it can circulate in the, in the speed of light, it's, uh, it's a radio frequency cavity that you have to fit with radio frequency. And uh, it used to be <coughs> done with um, glystros, uh, valves. Nowadays we use solid state amplifiers. This is a solution that we did, was developed in house with uh, Soleil, uh, the synchrotron in France. And, um, and the supervisor system for all, all these uh, boards, they have to be uh, tuned uh, individually. It's, uh, it was done in lab view and it's, it's basically managed on a daily basis uh, within this platform. Um, last but not least, this is a project that we, we have ongoing is the synchronization of these insertion devices. So basically they are a sequence of magnetic fields. They can change the intensity by changing this gap. And so you produce radiation in different ways. And so for the rest of the beamline, especially the optics, you have to synchronize the way you produce radiation with the optics of the beamline. So basically you have a monster like that, full of uh, magnetic dipoles. And it, as the electron passes through, you change the electron, the radiation em emission, then you have another beast, which is a monochromator that selects, based on prism, to select the, the radiation uh, that you, you want to use in your experiment. And you have to have a good synchronization between the two. So if you use the ondulators, this is a well-known uh, uh, technology. You can basically synchronize the two through Apex channels. And uh, we are trying to do this directly to the lab view real time. And, um, and the major uh, issue here is that we have to have a, such a way of control between the monochromator and the insertion device because changes on the, the way they are synchronized, so you have a certain bandwidth of radiation, you have a certain bandwidth of your monochromator, you have to match them, otherwise you have uh, fluctuations in, your ten, in the intensity that you deliver to the experiment. So this is an ongoing project that we are, we are I hope to be able to show in a few uh, months perhaps more about this. And um, so to conclude, just to give you an overview, uh, uh, we have nowadays basically high integrated uh, in successfully. We have, um, but uh, we want to move from a different systems. Uh, hypervisor seems to be uh, not the most ideal solution for uh, controlling this, uh, this, this shared memory. Um, so, um, and also, it has limits on the performance of EtherCAD. So the idea solution that we are looking forward is to use Linux real time directly on PXI and Compact Rio as something that we are um, we see that is ongoing already for Compact Rios and we're looking forward to see on PXI. It's something that uh, I think we're all uh, very keen to look. Um, so we are, by the end of the year, we hope to have all the beam lights done. We, they basically, all this, uh, this 16 we have already uh, out of 18. So there's two more beam lines only to go. And um, we are also integrating an iMotion uh, for emulators and, and monochromators. Uh, the new plans also, as soon as we have Linux real time available for PXI, we will start using and, and plan the move to our beam lines and perhaps to get as a solution for Sirius. Um, visual systems also is something that we are planning to use, although this is it's tricky because most of the cameras and detectors that we use, they have specific ways of handling the image. Um, and another also area that we're working on is to use compact video cards to measure really small currents, which is something that we are developing in-house, these cards, and to, to measure peak amperes -ampere, to milliamperes uh, in the, during the experiments. So with that, I, I finish. Um, and I thank all the collaborations from, from all the groups. These are, this was an effort that I showed from many different groups in the lab. And, um, and uh, of course, uh, NI Brazil had a major impact in all our activities. So I, I thank again for all the help and all the collaboration that we had. And I thank you for listening.
Well, like the example that we showed on the detectors, that we need a higher number of LEDs pairs. Basically, you don't have this provided on the PXI or SPXI. So we had to build ourselves a solution for that. For the bandwidth on the VPMs, uh, we are working still on a different solution, but that is performance related. It's just to immediate a custom solution for this kind of um, hardware. So most of the time, uh, it's, it's a trade-off. Uh, obviously, sometimes you need some solution which is very specific for that application, and you don't find boards for that. So nowadays, we're trying to you know, develop in-house. In the past, we used to develop in-house everything from, uh, from drivers to from motion controllers to you know, analog. Uh, position boards, digital, so on. And most of these things, I mean, it, they are hard to maintain to develop them in house, and it's not part, part, part of your business, so you really need to develop if it's something that is available. Now, if it's not available, then we do it on the house. Basically, that's the target of this. Someone else, please? centralized storage systems and, and, and processing systems. For, for instance, for tomography, which is very data intensive, uh, we have a separate uh, uh, system of GPUs that do all the processing. So basically, we do on GPUs. Yeah. <coughs> I have a small question of uh, system monitoring and, uh, and deployment. How do you deal with that on the hypervised systems? I'm sorry, with that. For deploying the software, upgrading, monitoring the oh. CPU temperatures, uh, hard drives. You so know. nowadays, uh, the, the way we deploy, uh, it's also within the, our centralized system, we have uh, basically all the images in, uh, in our storage system. So the PXI boot through, through the network it has all the image. So you have customized images for each one of the beam lines. So basically, we are deploying them remotely. And the way we manage is through the uh, centralized management system of, of, of LabVIEW. But uh, most of the time we have, uh, the system is, is uh, it's connected through these Apex uh, channels. So we can have information on the processing variables, we have information through the Apex, uh, Apex channel servers. On LabVIEW side, like temperature monitoring and all this stuff, too, then we use LabVIEW. Basically we have the two systems running in parallel. 